why are my kids <laughs> melting down? What is going on? Something's not adding up. I finally just pulled the plug completely on my kids. I said, forget this. I'm over the meltdowns after screen time. I'm over this behavior. It seems like it's bringing out the worst in you. Pulled the plug, prepared for the worst. But what happened was actually I got my kids back. It was the best parenting decision I made to date. I kind of just dove in head first. I gave them a, a full detox and then worked it back in later and we found a way through. I basically help good parents of great kids just take back control, not to banish it all forever, but just to get back in the driver's seat and make sure tech is working for you, not the other way around. My name is Lisa, mother of seven and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about screen time, what it does to kids' brains, what to do instead, how to break bad habits that may have formed, and then ultimately not to beat ourselves up too much whenever we feel that we've slipped into a season of too many screens. I know for us, this is something that sometimes is no big deal at all, and then sometimes we have to fight a little bit more it can be a a back and forth struggle. And so if you're in that place, don't worry, there will be encouragement in this episode with Molly DeFrank, author of The Digital Detox, which is a two week tech reset for kids. So join us, even if you are, you feel like you have a handle on this whole screen time thing, you might just find this episode very interesting. Well, thank you so much, Molly, for joining me. I'm excited to talk about today's topic. I get asked about this a lot and how I handle, you know, screen time and all of that kind of things with my kids. And I'd say there's an ebb and a flow and there's certain times when this is really easy and then certain times where we struggle with it more. But let's start with introductions. Tell us about you and your mission and maybe how you even got started with this mission. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Lisa. So I am a mom and adoptive mom to six kids ages 13 and under. And like most parents who are intentional and want to do get this thing right, um, you know, I read the books, I've been listening to the podcast, trying to do right by my kids, but I also am raising kids in a really difficult time to do that. So I bought into the marketing like a mm-hmm. lot of parents when uh, my oldest was born in 2009 and then in 2011 along came my second and we bought in early and often to the tablets, the the marketing that said, here's a way to raise little rocket scientists early, you know, get them on the tablet, help them really develop and learn and grow. And what I found was over the next couple of years, the marketing did not deliver on the promise. I wanted my money back. And I was getting that those nudges over time, like, why are my kids <laughs> melting down? What is going on? Something's not adding up. And it wasn't until about four Years ago, I finally just pulled the plug completely on my kids. I said, forget this. I'm over the meltdowns after screen time. I'm over this behavior. It seems like it's bringing out the worst in you. Pulled the plug, prepared for the worst. I was really scared because we all know it's the digital babysitter. So we rely Mm -hmm. on that a lot of times to get things done. But what happened was actually I got my kids back. It was the best parenting decision I made to date. And I just, without researching it, I kind of just dove in head first. I gave them a, a full detox and then worked it back in later and we found a way through and ever since then i've been helping parents that's what i that's what the book is about that i wrote digital detox it's the guide i wish i had early on in motherhood um to kind of get back in the driver's seat like a lot of i i basically help good parents of great kids just take back control not to banish it all forever but just to get back in the driver's seat and make sure tech is working for you not the other way around yeah yeah i think that's a really great mission And it sounds like you went basically cold turkey with it. How long before you got your kids back, but how long before I'm sure there was like this period where they had to figure out how to entertain themselves or maybe amongst you had a couple kids at that time. So how to maybe play together. Some of those things that I think we miss whenever they have such an easy form of entertainment. Yeah. Great question. So for us, it was immediate. It was like we flipped a switch. By the next day, That the worst part was by far the gap between delivering the news to the kids when they fall apart. And then the next morning when you're waiting for the fallout. And what we found in our home is that our kids just started playing with their toys. We told them, hey guys, you're not being punished for anything. 
you're not in trouble. We're just going to try something new for a little while. And they fell apart. It wasn't received well. That's the hardest (laughs) part. But by the next morning, they knew that if they asked for a screen, they would get a chore. So they realized pretty quickly, like, okay, well, we better figure this thing out. And they did. So I help a lot of parents through this. The um, experience of families is completely different. Some people find the same thing. Other people find it takes a couple days. And what I realized through the course of writing the book is that there's actually a physiological change going on in the brain, and we can get into that a little later, but there's a reason why why sometimes there's an adjustment period. Um, There's something that this technology, this digital entertainment is doing to our kids in their brain that it's, that makes it so beneficial to go cold turkey. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that. So what, I think the first question parents might have, or maybe you would know what, what they have, because this is what you do. And so people are constantly asking you questions, but what I'm assuming is the most common question you get is, so what do you have them do? Say you need to make dinner or do something around the house. And now your quick, easy, babysitter source of entertainment has been stripped away. I think people fear that they're not going to be able to still get things accomplished. So is that the question you get? And if so, either way, what's the answer? (laughs) Yes, that's a great question. And, and probably your listener, I mean, from what I gather from you and your mission, these are great parents. These are intentional moms. And so they're doing all the things and sometimes they just need that break so they can do more things for their family. So I completely understand Mm -hmm. that. Here's the thing. We're raising kids in a time when there are more options for them to do. There are more things for them to do than ever before. If you look around, I guarantee you, you've got a, a bookcase full of books. You've got a bin full of toys. The the problem isn't the lack of things to do for our kids. It's their lack of interest in those things. So Mm -hmm. that's what the detox, that's what the book is about is how to get that interest back in your kids so that they're satisfied. They're, they're off playing and creating on their own. Their interest is back. You're kind of, it's a defibrillator, the detoxes for your kid's interest in the non-screen activities. When you go cold turkey, what you're actually doing is you're resetting their dopamine levels in their brain. Real life activities, Play-Doh, you know, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, whatever your kids are wanting to do, whatever you want them to do, they don't really have a shot to get your kid's interest when they have screen time as an option during the day-to-day. They just don't because here's the secret. These tech company geniuses have baked addiction points into their games. And they've done that by jacking up the amount of dopamine that these games, these apps release in our kids' brains. Now, dopamine is this feel-good chemical that we all produce. That's just how the human brain works. So you go for a walk, dopamine. You eat a delicious bite of food, dopamine. Well, They have engineered the apps, the games, to release such high amounts of dopamine that real life can't compete. So when you suggest to your Mm -hmm. kids, go outside and blow bubbles. Yeah, they're they're so bored. Yeah, That's boring. Yeah. Right. Well, it's not their fault they're calling it boring. It's a physiological change. So when you take it away cold turkey, what you're going to find, and this is what all parents find, is that after the adjustment period, suddenly their kids because those dopamine levels are back to normal, now they can get interested. So now you bring out the list of here are some ideas and now they got a shot. And the more they practice going outside and blowing bubbles or making origami or whatever it is, now they've actually got a chance to awaken those real life interests. Yeah. And some some people might doubt this because it's been maybe years since you've, you know, not relied on screens and it's hard to imagine that your kids would find entertainment on their own. I think that's something that maybe parents struggle with. I know for me, the screen issue was a lot more challenging whenever I had a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a baby, and we lived on a really busy street in town because I had to watch all of the kids all of the time. And so if I didn't have some way to contain them, which obviously you can have like a gate in your kitchen. There's some easy ways to counteract that. But that was when it was more of a struggle. Like, hmm, the four-year-old and the two-year-old would be very entertained by a little show really fast while I, you know, work on something. Whereas now with where we live, with the number of kids I have and the ages, it's a lot different. And it's, they have a lot of entertainment amongst themselves. And also it's safe for a child to slip outside without you noticing. 
So I don't know, I guess the the practical tips there is probably just like setting up your house so that no matter where you live, there's some way that you can turn your back for a second and still be able to accomplish things. Is that a challenge a lot of people have? Okay, Lisa, I'm so glad you brought this up. It's such a great question because one thing I want to clarify for families is I'm not suggesting that parents move off the grid, go full-blown Amish, and ditch digital entertainment forever. Okay, major respect for Amish families, really, truly. But if that's not you, if that's not how you want to do the digital world, great. What I am suggesting is a two-week break, a two-week cold turkey break from digital entertainment for your kids. And that's actually the the first half of the book I wrote is exactly how to get through those two weeks. And then the second half is how to put technology back in its right place. How to make sure that digital entertainment is serving your family rather than you feeling enslaved to it. And a lot of parents will ask this question, well, what is the right number of minutes? And unfortunately, there is no magical number of minutes. Kids are different. Um, One child psychologist said that you need to look at interactive digital entertainment for your kids like doses because it's so it stimulates the brain in ways that we that it's really incredible what it's doing inside the brain it's it's amping up those levels of adrenaline and cortisol that stress hormone so if you've got kids for example with trauma backgrounds they're going to be more susceptible to a little bit of screen time it's going to you know make them hyped up kids with ADHD They can't handle as much digital interactive screen time. You're going to start to notice that. So I'm not going to prescribe exactly a number of minutes. And parents, you know your kids best. No one knows your kids like you do. So that's what makes this two-week detox period so amazing is that you already know your kids best. Now you are really studying them. What are they interested in when there's not a screen on the table? What are their vulnerabilities? What areas are they kind of a mess at? When the screen's not an option, you've been numbing them out instead of dealing with certain behaviors. How can you help equip them for the real world where entertainment is not always a solution to boredom or to frustration? So these are ways that we're really giving our kids tools to navigate the real world. Yeah, that all makes a lot of sense. And that's one of the top questions whenever we actually pulled the audience about this episode is knowing that screen time is going to be a part of the everyday world that our kids are going to live in even more than we do and than we did about teaching them how to, I think sometimes we think, okay, well, if we give them screens now, I mean, they're going to have to figure this out eventually because they're all going to be addicted to screens like we all are, you know, as adults. Now, part, part of what my philosophy is on this is I'm an adult. So I know to take the Instagram app off my phone and log out of Facebook for weeks at a time. But kids obviously need that direction. But what do you tell parents or do you address in your book, like how to introduce them so that they are more comfortable with screens because they're obviously going to be using screens at some point? I I mean, I don't think childhood is the time for it, but you have a 13 year old. So you're probably getting to the point where you're starting to think about when they're 16 and they are driving or, you know, how do you navigate that? Yeah. Yeah. So that is so important because our goal as we're raising our kids is not to raise kids who are always looking to us by the time they're 18, like, well, now what do I do, mom? The whole way. You know, we want our kids to grow and to learn their skills. So we just want to be there kind of scaffolding when we're making these rules for them. When our kids are still little, you know, I don't know about you, but my little ones, I got had a couple of them who if you let them in front of a, a bag of candy when they were little, they would just eat the whole thing you know? Mm -hmm. And some of the other kids, they would just kind of self-regulate. Well, our kids need us to set those boundaries for them when they're little. And the tricky thing is that now we're seeing this whole generation of kids having grown up with, it used to be the trend was give your kid a smartphone early. Look at their, this is part of the digital world. Well, you know, something curious is the strictest parents when it came to tech rules were the very people who created the technology. So you look at, mm, yeah. um, you know, those tech engineers, those entrepreneurs, Steve Jobs would not let his kids near an iPad because he knew the dangers. These mm-hmm. these parents go out of their way to send their kids to, to Montessori schools, to schools that don't have the technology because they know, and even one of them, I quote in the book said, we make this technology as brain dead 
easy to use as possible. There's no reason they can't pick it up later. So we're kind of fooling ourselves sometimes into saying they need to learn it. Well, no, they make the interfaces so simple. So what your kids actually need to learn is how to create. They need to learn problem solving skills. They need to learn how to troubleshoot boredom. But going back to something you asked about as our kids are teenagers, you know, I would just encourage parents that just because a giant portion of the population is doing it this way, is giving their kids these devices early and often, they're saying yes, doesn't mean you have to do it. Get together with some of your family, friends, relatives, and talk about it. Look at the research. Make your decisions about when to give your kids this technology. Make that those decisions on evidence, on prayerfully considering talking to your spouse. Don't just do it because, you know, Susie says she's the only one in her class without an iPhone. First of all, no, she's not. Okay. (laughs) No, she's not. Um, There are so many options. And I really believe the tide is starting to turn. I don't know if you saw... Recently, the Surgeon General came out with this warning yeah. um, about just the detrimental effects of social media on our kids. Yeah, You don't have to look very far to find a cautionary tale about this. And yet parents are still feeling a little sheepish and, and nervous to, to set down these rules. But I just want to empower parents to have the conversations with your kids. You know, if you do come into your tweens and teens and just say, no, case closed, you're going to have a tough time. But if you amp up that relationship with your kids and you bring your humility to the table, like you mentioned, talking to your kids, like, man, even Instagram is sticky for me. I can get stuck to it. I have to put limits on my own phone. Mm -hmm. And if you're kind of going through it with them, if you want to detox your tweens and teens, I highly recommend getting some skin in the game. Take a social media detox while they're doing theirs. There's a lot of power in, in humbly doing things with them. Yeah. All right, I want to take a break from this great conversation to tell you about today's podcast sponsor, Tubes & Co. Tubes & Co. is an organic skincare company. They have everything from face masks. I just saw on their website that they have a brand new face mask they just launched to face creams like moisturizers and serums. I especially love their glow serum to makeup. So I currently have on the Tubes & Co. foundation, the Tubes & Co. eye pencil with their little brush thing that makes it really easy to do eyebrows, the mascara. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else I have on here. (laughs) I own a lot more of their items if I ever want to do the whole contouring palette thing. And occasionally I do that, but most of the time I just stick with the basics for a fresh face that I don't have to worry about all of the junk in makeup. This has been a saga for me over the years because I know that what goes onto our skin actually makes its way in and it affects our health, but a lot of the products that are natural just aren't very good. And like currently right now I'm pregnant and I have the, whatever it's called when you get the mask and I I, I want coverage. I want to use the concealers and the foundations that are at conventional places, but I don't want the chemicals. Tubes & Co. completely solves that problem for me. I have sent all my friends and family their way I love that it's a small family owned company. They use all great ingredients. You you can check them out, look through them all. They use tallow from grass fed cows and just all things that I'm very comfortable putting on my skin and in my body. Tubes & Co. is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 10% off your order. If you wanna check it out, whether you're in the need for makeup or something to moisturize or cleanse, by using the code farmhouse. So go to tubesandco.com and use the code farmhouse to get 10% off your order and check out some awesome Tubes & Co products. Yeah, my oldest will be 15 this year and there's no sign of her getting a, a phone or any apps like TikTok or Instagram anytime soon. And there's not, it's actually not even a problem in our home. I know at some point, we're going to want it for safety reasons um, as she's driving. But at the moment, it's not even an issue. But it is something that we do talk about a lot. And I explain how creative they're able to be and how many things that they're taking on because their brains still function like God intended brains to function. One thing I've noticed, which is such an interesting phenomenon, I've just been noticing it lately, is how many teens I see at just public places where there are other people too, always with a little earbud in their ear. That's just new to me. And 
I can't imagine being in a public place and having something playing, but I've seen it multiple times in multiple different settings. Is that like this constant need for our brains to have some kind of information flowing into it, even when we're trying to do other things? It's like, well, at least something's talking to me. Our brains must be just completely crazy. Or maybe there's some other reason why kids always have an earbud in their ear. I honestly don't know. No, I think that's a really great observation. And and you're absolutely right. I was dropping my junior higher off at school this morning and we we looked at all the kids waiting for the bus and you, you got a group of kids, they're teenagers and no one's talking to each other. They got their heads all together. Down, earbuds in, they're together, but yeah, yeah. it's it, and what's really crazy is you you look at some of the research and how this is bearing out. You've got employers telling us that these kids coming into the workforce in their 20s, they're nervous about taking a phone call. They are getting, they're not able to make back and forth conversation. Kids in their 20s and in their late teens, they're not really dating as much because they they haven't practiced those social things that were kind of required of us where you'd, yeah, you're bored in the middle of summer, you go knock on the neighbor's door. Well, instead of doing those things that make us human, kids are numbing out on their devices and the opportunity costs are just, they're so high. Um, the data is just flowing in and I really think we're just scratching the surface. There's no surprise that the youth mental health crisis is through the roof. Try and book a mental health appointment for one of your kids right now. There's a wait list a mile long. And what's crazy is you, I read the Wall Street Journal pretty often and we subscribe to it. And so often we see these articles about um, people people calling on the government to step in with these social media companies. Oh, what are what is the government going to do? What are the uh, social media companies going to do to protect our kids? And meanwhile, I'm looking around like, parents, this is our time. You know, what can the government do? The family is the center. We are the primary influence of our kids. And if we are opening those floodgates for them early, you know, it's the cost is so high. So I just want to encourage you, parents, you are the primary influencer. You're the original influencer of your kids. So use that influence. And I think it's so beautiful, Lisa, what you said, that your daughter is, you know, you've had those conversations with her. She has the information. Our kids are smart and they're learning to use reason and they're looking and seeing like, I don't want to be like those kids who can't interact with each other. And so, you know, invite them into these conversations, ask them questions, amp up your relationship with them. It's the fix is really simple to this. It goes back to, to relationships with our kids. The Harvard study came out. This is within the last several years, but they studied these men over, over um, decades. So, so they've got all this data on these 80 year old men and they tried to figure out like, what are the big best predictors of health and longevity and happiness? And what they found out was regardless of income, regardless of what kind of job these men had, the, the, biggest indicator of happiness and health is relationship, interpersonal relationship. And our kids learn that. They learn how to have and build and expand their capacity for relationship. They learn that from their parents. So the more we can relate to our kids, the more we can get back to eye contact across the table, um, hiking with them, even talking with them on the car rides, um, you know, and then that's transferring later in life as they're relating to their peers and relating to teachers and employers and in dating relationships. And so we have this opportunity to expand that with our kids. Unfortunately, in the a majority of households right now, parents are just handing that influence over to a screen and the cost is so high. So I just want to encourage you to take that influence back. Yeah. I find it interesting that we're really careful about our kids' peer groups and who they interact with and making sure that, you know, we like the qualities of the people that they hang out with. And then we we give them a screen and then they can literally just hang out with anybody without us even knowing it digitally, which is a very obvious downside of the screen's there's there's a lot of danger there that I don't think parents in today's day and age really recognize as danger because we were used to the danger of before where the only danger is physical danger, somebody kidnapping you or doing something physical, but is not the danger that comes with the some of the interactions that the kids have on the screens just as dangerous. You're you're completely spot on. And 
Jean Twenge is a psychologist out at San Diego State who has done a lot of research on this. She compares the generations of kids to each other as teenagers. And one thing she noticed is that kids today, while they're exposed to sort of more explicit content sooner, they're actually growing up later because parents think that it's safer or they have for a while. I think parents are starting to wake up to this now, but um, they would assume, well, I need my kid to be safe. And so if my kid's Mm -hmm. in their room on a screen or gaming, they're safe. At least they're not Yeah, nothing physically bad's happening. Right. But just what you said, you know, you wouldn't drop your kid off at a, you know, a strip mall if there was a X-rated store and if there was, you know, free access to drugs, which is now a lot of these social media apps are are being used to to deal to kids, the kind of and even if we're not talking about explicit content, if we're talking about just worldview formation and we work so hard to kind of mm-hmm. impart that worldview on our kids and They've studied this, like what kids are, how much time kids are spending face to face with their parents talking about the world and their place in it. And even if you're a really good parent, you're doing that maybe 15, 30 minutes a day face to face, that would be a lot. But if our kids are on their devices for two, three, five hours a day, then how can parents compete with that in terms of worldview formation? So yeah, I would just, I think it's a good time to to reassess and look at the data and and just think, you know, I'm not telling parents you need to do screen time the way we do screen time. I wouldn't say that because I don't know your kids. You know your kids. What I would suggest is is asking yourself the question, is my ideal for our kids' technology relationship with technology, is my ideal matching with the status quo in our home? And if it's not, I want to help you get there. And you can do that. You can do it. I've helped a lot of parents do it. You just need to do, it starts with a break and then a new long-term plan. And it's so much simpler than it sounds, but parents are scared, but I promise you it will repay dividends. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about older kids and some of the detrimental things that happen with them on screens. What about just the three or four-year-olds watching Paw Patrol? What are some of the negative impacts of that and what why why is it making them grumpy how's it changing their brain we touched on that a little bit but let's dig a little bit deeper into that because i think that's where a lot of moms really struggle is with those younger kids and then wondering does this even matter is this really something worth uh all of my efforts to avoid yeah that's that's such an important question i have a really soft heart for that mom because i've been in those shoes this is i was the mom kind of struggling to get by. We had three kids in three years and it's so hard and your house is a mess and you're playing with your kids and you just need a break. Not so that you could sit and eat bonbons, but so you can like move the laundry over and prepare dinner and all those things. So, um, So I would just encourage you that this season is short, even though it doesn't feel like that. I remember people telling me that and I would think like, wow, you're a liar. You know, (laughs) and they're not lying. I promise they're telling the truth. It does. (laughs) The days are so long and and every single, they call it serve and return interaction, every single serve and return interaction between you and your kids, every single bout of eye contact, it matters. These are the building blocks for your kids. You're building trust. You're building, you know, their, oh, there's just so much there. So let's talk about gross motor skills that need to develop in our kids before they can move to fine motor skills. So our kids need to be running around outside. They need to be hanging upside down from the swing. That's how their vestibular systems are built. And these occupational therapists are actually identifying new conditions that they're calling virtual autism, where kids are coming into them and they're presenting like they're autistic. Their verbal skills aren't there. They're not able to interact or maintain eye contact. And upon closer scrutiny, they're finding, oh no, this isn't actually autism. This is what's happened when these kids have had so much screen time that they've missed out on those serve and return interactions, the the eye contact, the vestibular systems that need to build, the gross motor that then helps our kids develop fine motor. So these every single day that you're banking with your kids, that you're taking them to the park, that you're putting them on your lap and reading a book, they all matter. Every single one. I promise you. I promise you. You know, oh gosh, there's so much we can talk about here. Okay, let, let's talk about mm-hmm. functional language. I was talking to a speech therapist and she said, parents come in now and they'll say to me, 
you know, can you just recommend an app for me so, so my kids can learn language better? And she said she was, was trying to convey to these parents that kids cannot learn functional language skills from a device. They can't. And they actually proved this by trying to teach seven-month-old babies Mandarin. Um, they did this about a decade ago. And one group of seven-month-old babies, they had them exposed to Mandarin from a real-life person, face-to-face, -face, a loving kind of person warmly talking about it. And the other group of babies, they showed them Mandarin on a recording, on a video or audio. And the seven-month-old, they measured the how the brain responded. Um, the seven-month-old, the first group that heard it in person, they could actually recognize the sounds. And the second group, nothing. They couldn't recognize mm. a darn thing, which actually supports what the speech therapist told me, which is that kids come in and, and they'll, the parents will say, look, my kid has 30 words and they'll say bird, ball. Well, what she finds out after working with them for a little bit is those, those words aren't, they're not functioning as language. They're just kind of parroting the words. So there is so much, every time you sit with your kid, they, they retain information better from a physical book than from a tablet. Um, even just the act of turning the pages. So all of these things, even though it's a disastrous mess, and I know that <laughs> they matter. The tactile learning, all of it matters. So, so I just want to encourage you to to keep going. Yeah. Now, is there a difference between certain types of screen time? Like to me, a slower moving family movie feels less bad than a game or something where it's really short content. Or there's some YouTube channels that my kids like that they're just so crazy. Everything is just so fast and in your face. And I think this is definitely worse for their brains than like us sitting down for a family movie. Do you find that to be the case or like games or what is worse? Yeah, you're spot on. There's a child psychologist who had actually, she had a, a really good book about this and has done a lot of studies. And she said that interactive digital entertainment, so gaming, tapping on you know apps on your tablet or on an iPhone it does something different to the brain than a slower paced movie or television show so your gut is completely right lisa it affects the brain differently and you might notice if you're listening and you've observed your kids after a family movie night and they can transition just fine from a movie to bedtime um, but you might notice that if you're at a restaurant mm -hmm. and they've used a tablet and then you need to take the tablet where the battery dies, they they fall apart. And there's a reason behind that. So I, you had actually asked this earlier and I forgot to kind of exp to go into that a little more. But um, it really does go back to the dopamine. You know, I, I was mentioning earlier that these devices are are having our brains release such extraordinarily high amounts of dopamine, that feel-good chemical, that when the timer dings, even when you give your kids a warning, that's why warnings aren't really helpful for our kids. You take the device away and they fall apart. It's like you look at this kid, you're going, that's not my sweet little angel. Who who are you? You know, you're crazy. <laughs> um, but the reason is that you're watching a dopamine crash in real time. Mm -hmm. So they're experiencing, you know, 100 to zero just like that. So it's not entirely their fault. It's, there's something going on in there. Also, They've got those, that adrenaline, they're in fight or flight mode and some of the, depending on the games they're playing. So they're really amped up, especially if your kids have ADHD. Another interesting thing is kids who, so that psychiatrist or the psychologist I had mentioned, um, what she does is she'll diagnose different conditions in kids' behavioral issues like oppositional defiance disorder, bipolar disorder, ADHD. She will not diagnose uh, her, any of her patients until they have undergone a one month digital fast because what she found in her practice is that something like 80% of her kids of her patients their their all their symptoms will resolve hmm. so they don't have to medicate them they they have been able to equalize it just through those environmental changes which blew me away mm -hmm. that is really crazy and that also makes a lot of sense that they wouldn't want to diagnose anything before ruling out something that's so often the problem I want to take a quick break from this episode to tell you about something that I absolutely love in my kitchen, and that is Redmond Real Salt. Up till now, I use that in my cooking. I use it in my ferments. Whenever you make foods from scratch, like bone broth and sauerkraut, you use a lot of salt. 
Now I'm into this cheese making thing where I also am making a brine. I need a high quality salt in large quantities. So I'm buying these huge buckets and bags of salt and the place that I have found to source them from that is the least expensive, but then the highest quality, it's just that blend of both is Redmond Real Salt. It's the only salt I've used in my kitchen for a while now. <laughs> I'm trying to think of exactly how long. Definitely over a year. Redmond has kindly offered Simple Farmhouse Life listeners a 15% off discount. By using my link, it'll automatically be applied. After you use my link, whenever you add something to your cart and you go to checkout, there will be 15% taken off. My link is bit.ly forward slash farmhouse Redmond bit.ly forward slash farmhouse redmond all lowercase bit.ly is case sensitive i've learned lately so make sure you're typing that in all lowercase to get 15 percent off redmond real salt if you are a from scratch cook like myself i highly recommend the 10 pound bag or gallon bucket i've ordered it either way but I really like buying it in bulk because I can use the discount code for a larger purchase, which means that I'm getting more off. Again, head to bit.ly forward slash farmhouse Redmond to get Redmond real salt in your kitchen. All right, we got lots of questions specifically related to detoxing that I thought were really interesting. One of them was, can you undo damage that's been done already? How do you know if the damage to your kids has been done with screen time? So is there anything that just is... You can't undo it. Okay. I'm I'm so glad someone asked this because I forgot to say this at the beginning, but we need to pick up the mom shame that sometimes sits in this conversational space and we need to just mm -hmm. throw it out the window. I don't think there is any shame in trying out new technology or new techniques as a parent and then noticing something you don't like and then reassessing and making changes. I think that's actually the mark of wisdom and really good parenting. So if there's any shame lurking on your shoulder, just cast that out there. So here's a really interesting thing. The brain is plastic. So the brain can be rewired. And, you know, as an adoptive parent who has parented kids from trauma, um, that's one of the most encouraging things that I have learned is that you can change. People can change. The brain can change. And especially our kids. So so it's not too late to start. Right now is the best time. Give it a shot. And I think just take inventory with your spouse, with your if your parents are involved in parenting your kids. Talk about maybe set some goals like, man, we really want to address this thing. This kid cannot wait or they can't be bored. Um, they're really struggling with it. How do we how do we kind of troubleshoot this thing? And during your detox, you will see growth by leaps and bounds, I promise you. Our kids are growing so fast. They can learn so quickly and they will. Yeah, I agree. And everybody is creative too. There's so many things that your kids are going to figure out what to do with the time that was they were in the habit of screen time earlier. Sometimes it just takes a little while for that to come to the surface. Okay, another person asks, they say, we got rid of our television 18 months ago and now we only do screen time with kids Bible stories on YouTube occasionally, but they still continue, continually whine for screen time. Do you need to do a full six weeks detox from the little time that they do get? Any other advice? We have four kids ages six and under. So basically they're still asking even with the occasional screen time. Have you found that happening? Yes, for sure. Um, so I think also that's a really good point that there can be so many great uses of technology and Bible stories on YouTube. We, my kids love that too. And um, and your podcast is such a great, your show is such a great example of using technology in a redemptive way. So there are really great, um, great things out there. But one, one way I would encourage you to fix that is put technology, I talk about this in the second half of the book, when you're creating your long-term plan, find spaces for that technology in your long-term plan. So that will help alleviate a lot of the asking. So one thing we did after our detox was we said, you know what, during the weekdays, during school, no digital entertainment, no no gaming, okay, for example. Sometimes during the week, we'll watch like a, a family cooking show together or a movie and we enjoy that. And after chores are done, I see nothing wrong with that in our house. But we found it really helpful to just move the other stuff to one hour on the weekends, guys. So then they don't even ask. A quick story about that that, kind of cracks me up to this day is one of my good friends was, uh, we were homeschooling. Our kids were younger. I probably had four kids about the ages of your, 
uh, the question that was asked at the time. And I was talking to my friend's friend about how hard it was to take the kids to the library when they're four of them and they're six and under and it's so hard and they're running around and it's embarrassing. And I said, you one thing I really hate is we go in the library and they beeline for the little kid computers. And I don't want them mm-hmm. playing games. Right. And my friend said something. She said, yeah, you just tell your kids, we're not playing games today. We're here for books. And it was, it made me laugh. I'm like, oh yeah, duh. Just like you tell the kids in the store. <laughs> Why did I think of that? Like, oh, we're not, yeah, we're not buying candy today. And it's like, no, that's, that's not for now. We're not doing that right now. So point is feel empowered to put those in the place that you and your spouse have decided. This is a good place for that. Grandma's house, you know, we don't set cr- screen time limits at grandma's house. Um, when our kids are there for a sleepover, they watch their shows. You, you know, you can you can work with it. But bottom line is put it in its right place, whether that be a, a time, a day of the week or a time of day and and just remind your kids, oh, no, that that's not even an option right now. And they'll they'll learn pretty quick. Yeah. And one thing I was just thinking when you were saying that is uh, we know what happens to the brain while watching screens. And so we know why that wouldn't be something we'd want to do all the time. But I think sometimes we forget about what you're not learning and what you're not doing whenever there is screen time. And I know some adults who feel like they don't know how to do a lot of certain things because they spent all of their kid years watching TV and there was just not the time and the opportunity to try your hand at something, fail, get better at it. You know, that's, it's not just what's happening with the screen. It's what's not happening too. Absolutely. And, you know, if you asked parents, if they were, you know, sitting around a coffee table, kind of not in the trenches at the moment, and you asked, what do you hope to accomplish? What do you want for your kids? What do you want them to take away from living under your roof? What are the virtues you want to develop in them? They would they would come up with some really awesome ideas. You know, well, we want to develop grit and endurance and uh, and courage and all of these things. And you need to go back to, and I help parents do this in the book. This is right at the front of the book. You want to go back to, does your day-to-day align with your vision of what you're trying to accomplish when your kids are under your roof? And if not, just change it. You can change that. And it really only just takes a little bit of of effort and planning on the front end. And and one really interesting thing that I came across um, in researching for the book is that the brain goes through these periods of pruning. So in like when kids are about four or five, and then again, when they're early teens, the, the connections that are not used, they just kind of go dormant. So if you've got a teenager who is spending all of his time gaming, you know, eight hours a day or whatever, he's gonna get really good at that. If, on the other hand, he's spending his time practicing piano or, you know, interacting and doing speech and debate or even just having conversations with mom and dad and his siblings or building or gardening or whatever it is, he's going to get good at that. So just assess, like, is this, does my household look the way I want it to for the goals we're trying to accomplish as parents? And if not, pick up the book. I want to help you change that. Yeah, that is, yeah. Very valuable. So tell us where we can find your book, where to follow along with you on Instagram or wherever wherever you're sharing content most regularly. Yeah. So you can go to my website, mollydfrank.com. You get some freebies. If you order the book, make sure you go to my website because I'll give you some free stuff. Like if you've listened to this podcast and you want to do it and you're gung-ho, you want to do the detox, but your spouse isn't so sure, I've got a free spousal convincer guide. Oh, you there can you save go. the marital strife. <laughs> download that, hand it over. You have lots of good stuff, how to break the news to the kids. Lots of good freebies when you order the book. You can also follow me on Instagram. I like sharing helpful tips or stories I come across um, just to encourage you on this journey. Parenting's really hard. Right. It's not easy for anybody, but it's worth it. Every single thing you pour into your kids it's worth it. So I just, I would love to encourage you find me on Instagram, Molly DeFrank. Yes. So many great resources and encouragement. I think summer is the best time. Even though the parents who homeschool or who don't homeschool, there is this extra time in the summer. If you're taking off of lessons to where it might be more tempting whenever you're not in this really strong routine. And I think parents start to feel that the screens become more and more something that there's a pull to. So I think the two week detox, this is a perfect time to embark on that. So we will also leave the link to your website and the book and the Instagram 
down in the description box or the show notes wherever you are getting this podcast. So thanks again so much, Molly, for joining me. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. I do encourage you to go check out the Digital Detox by Molly DeFrank. If you need some encouragement to implement some of these changes in your own home, I will see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast.